class here. And I know you can get websites on it and stuff like that, but how can you get stuff off your flash drive on it and test it? Just drag it on it. Oh. Yeah, that's what I did last time, and we can, we will see examples of that today, I'm okay. sure. All right. Okay, last time we sort of gave an overview of the mobile world, being apps and mobile websites. And that's probably about all that we'll have to say about apps until way late in the term. Late in the term, we may look at um, a tool that allows you to take HTML code and turn them into a native app. And the big win with that, of course, is that that alleviates the multiple development. All right, you, you can, instead of having a mobile site that's coded one way and an iOS app that's coded in another way and an Android app that's coded a third way, you can start with a base of, um, a base of um, HTML code and you can port it across the board. It won't necessarily give you the best app, but it'll give you an app, all right? without multiple uh, entry. But at any rate, that's the last word we're going to have on apps until late in the semester. So our focus is going to be on mobile websites. And I realize this is review, but I think it bears review, uh, reviewing because I sort of want to organize it maybe a little bit different way. And in a nutshell, you have two approaches. You have one site or multiple sites. And I think we noticed an example of a multiple site thing when we went to CNN. When we went to CNN, we got sent to mcnn.com. That's totally different code. As opposed to many other sites, if you go to their site, you're still on the same site. We notice a list apart. When we went to a list apart, it was still a list apart, both in the mobile device and in the uh, both in the mobile world and uh, and the desktop world. A lot of that deals with a lot of that depends on just how different you want the mobile experience to be from the desktop uh, difference uh, of the desktop version. Remember, there's two things going on. Two factors that influence why mobile sites need to be different than a desktop site. One is the physical limitations, so that screen size, internet connection, processor speed, etc. The other is user goals. As we mentioned last time, users typically, if they're visiting a mobile website, aren't necessarily surfing the web leisurely. They probably want a quick answer to something. Whereas, if I was going um, to spend more time really digging in and investigating a site, I'd probably be more apt to do that on a laptop or a desktop. The physical limitations, obviously, the size of the screen, the internet, I knew there was one I forgot, the nature of the input, touch screen versus physical keyboard, and so on. So that's why we want things different. You can't put as much on a mobile screen as you can a desktop screen. Users are probably interested in less detail anyhow. All these things point to there being a difference between these two. And essentially your approach is one site or multiple sites. All right? Now, under the one site model, we have a whole slew of what I will call and group together responsive techniques. These will include, first of all, having a clean separation of content and appearance. That is, we're going to, we're going to do this by the book. We're going to follow all those rules that we talked about in CISS 216. No break tags, no font tags. 
no color attributes on things. All right. Anything that deals with the appearance is going to be in CSS. It is only the content that will be in the HTML. And this should, for the most part, be review. All right. That being said, we'll still go over some examples of what I mean and, and that sort of thing with that. So that's one. Th this is this is how would I say this is like this is like the foundation. If you don't get this right, you're going to have trouble the rest of the way. Second thing I would say is using relative instead of fixed. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean using percentages instead of absolute pixel sizes. All right? Or mapping points. Or, yeah, or anything like that. Anything that's, like, specific. You know? Instead, use relative. And that deals with image sizes. That deals with width, widths of things. Um, anything that you can make relative, you should make relative. This is a CSS thing. We're going to be doing floating a lot. All right, not always, but we'll typically do floating more than fixed positioning. We might write some JavaScript. There can be some JavaScript stuff that you can do that falls under the category of responsive. All right. What if we wanted to do like a Java applet? Can we do that? Or would we consider that just extra work? Typically. Typically, a Java applet, I'm trying to think, a Java applet in, included in a mobile page probably wouldn't be a good idea. If you put a Java applet in a page, a, a responsive page where it displayed on the desktop but didn't display on the mobile, that probably would be good. But like if you had a Java applet for whatever. What, you, what I would do is do similar to what I did in the example last time of saying, okay, I'm going to hide that if they're on mobile. Okay. All right. That would probably be what I would do. But you can use JavaScript to accomplish some responsive techniques as well. Lastly, we can use server-sided stuff. Server-sided stuff, yeah. Server-side scripting to accomplish that. Later on in the book, we're going to talk about something called Werfel, which is a goofy name, but it allows the server to get information about the user's device. Um, it's essentially a database that it takes the request, looks at who is making the request, looks it up in this giant table to determine, oh, that is a um, LG G2 phone. It has a such and such side screen, and it is capable of this kind of video, and it has all these uh, pieces of functionality. And then you can use that code on the server side to make your page responsive. At the very least, uh, an obvious example is I could look to see if the user had an iPhone or an Android phone. And if they had an iPhone, I could maybe put a link to our iPhone. You know, here's our mobile web page if you want to download our mobile app go here, and I could put a link right to the Apple I, uh, App Store. I could do the same thing to Google Play if there was on an Android device. Would you use that for, say, like, whenever you visit a website mobile, usually it asks for, like, your location. Would you be able to use that to ask the person their location visiting the website? Uh, not... Not not Werfel per se. Werfel is like device based, but there is code that you can put in um, that actually runs through a combination of the, that you can do through JavaScript that could, in HTML5, ask the user for their location. You'll be prompted if you want to say yes or no to that, 
And if it's yes, then the JavaScript can pull the coordinates of the person, uh, GPS coordinates, and then do things like, you know, draw a map of where they are or something along those lines. So, yeah. Yes, you can do it. That wouldn't per se be worthful. It would be a combination of JavaScript and actually what's built into um, HTML5, which is called geolocation. So we'll definitely see examples of that later on. So all these things sort of rolled into one, and maybe stuff that I'm not even thinking of, is what I mean by responsive techniques. And that's what you're going to do if you have a page, all right, that you want to look one way on a mobile device and another way on a mobile device. One, what, what I, did I say one way on a mobile device and another way on a mobile device? One way on a desktop and another way on a mobile. All right? Now, if the difference between the mobile site and the full version of the site is too huge, it might be better to just say, hey, I would rather have two sites. I would rather have a mobile site and a desktop site and simply have a traffic comp, have some server-side code to direct the user one place or another. All right. Can you get consistency issues, though? Yeah. You, 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 well, you have the potential for consistency issue, and you can get around that by using some clever server-side programming. So, for example, if I had Let's say I had a new site, and on my desktop version of the site, I wanted to display 50 news stories on the home page, um, or whatever, 50, let's say, to make it a big number. And on the mobile version, I wanted to have a three, the three top stories on my, on my home page. What I could do is I could do something like I could create a server-side function in PHP where I would pass an argument to say, give me this number of news stories. And I would have it coded. I would have that one function in sort of a common library. And then the mobile application would call it and say, or the mobile website would call it and say, I want three news stories. The desktop would say, I want 50. And it would get returned different things. And then the, the, the server-side code on the mobile side would format the three. The uh, server-side code on the um, uh, desktop uh, version would, would format 50 of them. So yeah, there, there's things that you can do to sort of mitigate that. And that is always the risk when you start talking about having multiple versions of things. It's like, I don't want to do twice the work, all right? And that's where some planning, and if you're clever, you won't do twice the work, hopefully. You'll do more than one time the work, but hopefully you won't do two times the work. Maybe you'll do 1.5 times of the work if you're clever, all right? So, if you have multiple sites, you know, probably a mobile and a desktop, first of all, you're not going to forget all this stuff, because you can do all this stuff too, and that can help you out to a degree. Because even when I talk about mobile sites, that's a wide range, all right, as far as screen size and so on and so forth, all right? So, even if I talk about mobile, that's kind of a broad term, all right? So, we'll have some server-side scripting to direct the user to the proper site. And then we're going to apply these responsive techniques. These same ones here. So that's kind of an overview of what we did last time as far as the intro goes. All right. What we want to do, or what I want to do today, is really start talking about these responsive techniques. This is later on in the semester. But specifically talk about the CSS ones, having the clean separation, having the um, um, using floating, using relative, and all that. And we're going to see what we can do with that, and then we'll, we'll build upon that. Now one thing to keep in mind is, as a general rule, mobile sites are going to be not multi-column, and they're typically going to be simpler. So, you know, fancy background images and all that, you're probably going to avoid um, on a mobile uh, site as opposed to a desktop site. So let's go and let's make a site 
And let's explore, oh, I forgot a key point here. Let's explore these three things. The point that I forgot is media queries. And media queries are what allows us to um, tell the browser, use this style sheet if you're this kind of device, use this kind of style sheet if you're this kind of device. So we'll, um, we'll review that. So we'll review these things first, then we'll hit that. And that probably will take us through today. Um, and we'll, we'll see. We know we, we don't have class on Monday, so next week's a short week. And that always confuses me because I'm, I'm still getting used to my schedule, of course, because it's a new schedule. You know, I'm just getting used to being back on campus for one thing, you know, but I'm getting back used to my new schedule. And this is my one day Wednesday class. So it's like, okay, first day of the week, I have web development in 268. Next week, is I'm, is, I'm not going to have that. And then the third week, I'm going to be totally baffled about what I'm going to have to do. So if you see me wandering around the halls uh, in week three, you know, tell me what day it is, tell me what classes I have, and I'll appreciate it. All right. What are some of the things that you would avoid doing in order to have a clean separation of content and content? What are some things that I always... I won't say scream, because I don't think I scream ever, in, at least not in class. What are some of the things that I said were bad ideas in web development? Putting colors, with the H1 Putting colors in, in, H, in the H1, absolutely. What is another one? It's the one that people always say, you tell us not to do that, but what if I want to do this? The break tag. People always say, you know, I want to use a break tag. And I'm like, nope, a break tag is almost never needed. And people are like, well, what if I want to do that? Well, you could do that with a margin. You could do that with a, you know. So those are the things that you want to avoid. People love break tags. Pardon me? People love break tags. Yeah, I know. They're so convenient. They are very convenient. And, and that's why they're there. Um, how do I want to say this? This is, this is where my, my Catholic school background comes into play. If a font tag is a mortal sin, uh, a, a, a break tag is a venial sin. All right, The mor mortal sins are like the really bad sins, you know. And so using a font tag would be really bad. A, a break tag would be a venial sin, which means it's not bad, but, you know, or it's bad, but it's not like, it's not like you murdered someone. But I would, you know, being in the academic world, I think it's my job to kind of um, be an advocate for the best use of standards uh, everywhere. All right, let's open up Notepad++. Someone opened up calc.exe in it. Nice. And I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to start off by putting in my doc type. Does everyone, does everyone remember what a doc type does? It tells the browser whether it's going to be a fixed web page or a transitional. Um, yeah, uh, you, you're, you're essentially right. Uh, I would change some of that um, um, wording a bit because you can specify whether it's like an, an XML1 transitional or, or uh, XHTML1 transitional or whatever. The doc type essentially says which language you're using in a nutshell. So your choices for the most part are HTML4, um, H, uh, XHTML1, XHTML1 strict, XHTML1 transitional, and then finally for this class we'll be using HTML5 stuff. So this doc type relates to HTML5. So that's what that means if I put that at the beginning. And that's a clue that sort of helps the browser figure out how to do certain things. We then, if we're going to look at the sort of skeleton of a web page, 
it's going to have a head within the HTML tag, and it's going to have a body. And within the, um, I'm sorry, within the head tag, it is going to have a title. Now, if you remember last time, I had a couple extra style sheets. Let me download those and include them in this page. Let's do a save. Save it on the desktop as did find a program to um, join mp4 files, so that was nice. I don't know if I was talking about that in this class or not, but um. yeah, so probably, probably I was talking about it on my Tuesday, Thursday class. All right, I'm going to copy this FF, CSS, and this HTML5 shiv. I don't remember when you folks had CISS 216. Do you remember these files? It's okay to say no, don't. Okay. All right. Good. These files serve a couple of purposes. These files are related to HTML5 compatibility. one, this one that is ff.css, is for versions of Firefox before a certain version number. And I don't, I don't have that memorized. I don't know what that version number is off the top of my head. But certain versions of Firefox did not support HTML5. And that's the problem. People were developing the specification as people were developing the, um, the browsers. So what this does is this sort of tricks the browser into treating some of the HTML5 tags correctly. And if we look at this, we look at this style sheet, some of the new tags in HTML5 were the header tag, the footer tag, the article tag, the section tag, and there's a handful of others. Those are block elements. They're just like more specific versions of divs. So in the old days, in pre-HTML5, pre if you wanted a navigation, you're likely to have a div with an ID of nav. And if you had an article, you're likely to have a div with an ID of article. Now there's actually a nav and article tag. And that actually makes writing CSS a little simpler. All right? So, what the Firefox CSS file does is it gives a hint to the browser, hey, I know you don't know what a header, nav, section, article, aside, or footer is, but treat it like a block tag. 
And that fixes a lot of the compatibility issues, not all of them, of course, but that fixes a lot of the browser compatibility issues um, with earlier versions of Firefox. All right. Now, so that's that one. You can just copy my version of it and include it, but do make sure you include it um, in, your, uh, in your code. This next line, 10 through 12, effectively does the same thing for versions of IE prior to version 9. Simply because Internet Explorer is a beast unto itself, Firefox doesn't know what those tags are, but you can still style them. Internet Explorer doesn't know what those tags are, and unless you do something in JavaScript, you can't do anything with them. So what this code does, HTML5 shiv, and you can look and you can download a version of it if you want, or you can just use mine, is this says, hey, if you're in IE and you have a version of 9 or less, run this little snippet of JavaScript, and this little snippet of JavaScript does the same thing for old versions of IE as this did for Firefox. It tells the IE browser to treat nav, header, section, article, and so on tags as block tags. So again, it, it makes it a little more compatible uh, for that one. Other browsers simply see this as a comment. But IE, of course, being IE and being unique and having its own sort of quirky effects, this is viewed as an if statement that says if IE is less than, the version of IE is less than 9. For Firefox, it's going to think that's an HTML comment and, and not do anything. So when you're writing in HTML5, it would be a good idea to put this in all of your pages, at least for until the browsers that are affected here become out of date. How do you know what browsers support what? Well, that's like the million dollar question, isn't it? There are some good sites for this. If you Google HTML5 browser support, It might be good, but this is the one I was thinking of. Can I use? And if you pick a particular element, can you use the audio element? This shows you what versions of Firefox uses it and what versions don't. The audio element. New semantic elements, that's the one that I meant. That is the, the section, all right. So prior to version 30 of Firefox, it uh, implements it, anything earlier than that. Chrome, from the word go, i.e., it's telling you HTML9, but I don't believe that. All right, but anyhow, this shows you the browser versions that would support a particular element. Okay, so now we have a starting point. So, let's review some of our CSS stuff as far as making relative stuff and uh, things along, uh, along that line. All right. So, let's say I wanted to make a page with two things side by side, two, two columns. I want a navigation and I want an um, article. 
all right, or a content area. So I will say, I will put a nav tag, nav is an HTML5 thing again, and an end nav tag. Then I'll put a section tag and an end section. Again, for those of you that have not done HTML5, these are just more specialized versions of the div. They're like divs, except they tell you precisely what they are. That first one is a like a div, except it's for navigation. The second one is just a more generic section. All right. I'm not going to do anything like put an align attribute on that. Um, again, I won't say align left or anything like that because that's embedding in my HTML something about um, yeah the, the styling of it. All right. So let's imagine I want the nav side by side with the content. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sort of dummy things because the specifics of the content don't matter. So I'm going to just put in a, a link or a series of links. I'll just put the URL as being pound sign. I'll just copy so that we have several of these. Okay, so there's that. And then I'll go and pull some Greek text for Without any styling whatsoever, how is this going to look? One after another. One after another right? It's going to be just in the normal flow. Because it's a nav is uh, nav end sections are both block elements. They go they extend all the way across and they go down. Alright? So I can go and save this and view it. And sure enough, that's what we're going to get. Right there we have our links and we have our text. Putting them side by side. One way we could do it is say position fixed and then put the one thing one place, the one thing in another. We could give each of them a width and we could put them side by side. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do a flow. All right. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create my own style sheet now. We're finally going to get into where we have our own actual style sheets instead of those HTML5 compatibility style sheets. So I'll say new and I'll save it as I'll call it style1.css. And I will put, again, on the nav, I'm going to say with, with 30%. I have an excuse today for um, if I appear absent-minded or if I type wrong, I gave blood, so I, I'm probably working only at like 70%. I, I, I don't know if it was because of that or just because of the start of the semester, but when I got home, I, I went home uh, today instead of staying, I was exhausted. I, I took a nap, and I got up at about 4.30, and I came here, and I feel a little more wide awake, but I still feel like not 100%. So 
So I'll say float left. Then I'll do a similar thing. Don't you need a period or a pound sign before add? No. Why not? You used to need a period or a pound sign in front of them because we didn't have a nav tag. And we said ID equals nav or class equals nav. Now in HTML5, we have a nav tag. So remember when you don't have anything in front of it, a pound sign or a dot, you're referring to the HTML tag of that name. So now that nav is an HTML tag, you can just say nav. That's really one of the nice things about HTML5 is you don't have to create all these goofy classes and IDs that, that could be confusing. You can simply say, I want all my navs to be treated this way. And then it's like an H1 or whatever, we can style it. You still do create other classes. You can create classes, but you're creating classes more for uh, the reason that they were meant to be created as opposed to uh, creating them because HTML doesn't have a nav section or something like that. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to put a width of say 60% and float left. All right. Let me save that. Let me embed that. I'm going to put it after the other style sheet. Why? Because I want mine to take precedence over that. So I'm going to go and say style1.css. Now if I view it, there's 60% of it, or that is 60%. Here is 30%. And as I resize it, it goes like that. Let's view this within the Opera one. And this will answer your question from, from uh, earlier. How do I open one of my things in it? So let's open up Opera Mobile. And let's pick this one. And I drag that on, and I have that. All I did was just click on it, drag it, and put it on. All right. Now, if I go and create another mobile device, and drag that on, notice that, again, uh, it's a little bit smaller because this is a smaller device. Let me find the tiniest one I can see. This one's pretty small. All right. Now we talked about this time that that that's that's unreadable. All right. Um, and I forgot to put in the viewport, which we did in the example last time. So let me go and put that in. Save that now, and now I'll go and hit refresh, and that one, hit refresh in this one, hit refresh on this one. Okay. So. We've used some of the responsive techniques, right? We didn't put in a, um, anything absolute. We put in relative positioning with floating. 
and we use relative sizes by doing percentages. If we did something like this, I'm going to go in temporarily and cut this. Then I'm going to say with 300 pixels position absolute top 0px left 0px this is a how not to do this Then, if we viewed this in the mobile version, that's not what I expected. Yeah, but it's this way. Oh, um, I know what I did wrong. I think. Position absolute, top zero pixels, left zero pixel, width 300. I was going to say, if, if I can't even code a fixed page, then I've been out of commission longer than I thought I have. That's sort of a tip-off. If it looks like your CSS isn't being used, it, it could be that you have a syntax error, in which case it's disregarding it. So here, all right. I think it's safe. Okay. All right. So if I look here, that's how it looks in the browser, which is pretty much the same way that it looked with the floating. But if I view this in a mobile device now, I have to scroll over like that. So that's not good. So this is clearly a case for floating it is going to be much better than um, much better than um, using absolutes. All right. So let's get it back to that, because I still think we can do a little bit better. Oh. By simply using the one responsive technique, we've made the mobile look a lot better um, than it would have if we used the fixed technique. 
But you know what? I'm still not really happy with the way this looks like. All right? This looks, you know, this is, you know, that column is kind of small. It would be better, again, oftentimes in mobile sites you don't have a, um, you don't have a um, multi-column layout. You have a single column layout. So, I want a multi-column layout on the desktop. I want a single column layout on mobile devices. How can I do that? That's where I can apply the other technique that we talked about, and that is, pardon me? Media, media queries, absolutely. I can put a media query in here and write one set of CSS so that a single column and another set of CSS so it, um, on, a, on, a, on a larger, uh, on a desktop machine, it applies a different CSS. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the mobile first approach. Now, we'll talk more about these two approaches and what the alternatives are and when to use one, when to use the other, probably either at the end of class today or the beginning class uh, of, uh, of next week or, or on Wednesday next week. But the idea of the mobile first is you figure out and you get the mobile CSS right and then you add stuff on. All right? The opposite of that approach is called graceful degradation where you get the full version of the site working correctly, and then you whittle away stuff to get to the mobile. We can discuss the various advantages and disadvantages. If you're starting from scratch, the mobile first approach is probably better to do. So that's the approach that we're going to take. So in either way, you end up with two style sheets. One starts off with the full version and whittles it down to the mobile, the other starts with the mobile version and adds stuff to it till you get the full version. So that's the approach we're going to take. So I'm going to go into my style sheet and I'm going to make the mobile one work first. And well, I could do this a couple different ways, but I could say with 100%, let's say, float left, with 100% float left. Um, I could say then, you know, border... one pixel black solid put red solid here and I can save this and now I can view it in the mobile devices and there we have we have the black border and we have simply one column. Alright. Now what's wrong with this? I probably don't want the links oriented vertically on a mobile device because that's taking a lot of stuff going down. So I want to change the way that the um, the way that the, the list items are oriented. Does anyone recall how to do that? Display inline. Display inline, exactly. So I'll go here and I will say li display inline And for good measure, I'll say UL. Yeah, let's style type nine. Thank you. All right. So now, when we have this, link, 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 link. Right now we only have the one style sheet. So everyone, even the desktop, is going to get this style sheet. And maybe that's okay. 
right? Maybe that's an okay way to do it, but maybe we want to get more involved. And for the sake of argument, we're going to say, yes, we want, we want to have a multi-column uh, approach. And maybe you would want to do more with the colors, and maybe we want a background image or whatever, but to start out minimally, to introduce the concepts of the media query, we're going to minimally make these have multiple, co uh, multiple columns. So, what am I going to do? I have to create a, another style sheet. So I'll create new. And I'll call it desktop. And I will put the code in. including the media query and I'll put that in after the base style sheet. Let me make this a little bit smaller so we can see it all at once. So now notice that we have a few style sheets here. Again, we'll, we can forget about these these happen first. We then have our mobile style sheet, and then following that, we have our desktop style sheet. So how is this going to work? It's going to work in order. At first, first pass through, the stuff in the mobile style sheet is applied, and it's applied to everyone because we don't have a media query there. All right? That simply says, that's simply CISS 216 style sheets. It says, take this style sheet, apply it to this page. All right. The second one says, this style sheet applies only in these conditions. So only screen, which refers to a computer screen or a laptop screen, as opposed to a mobile screen, and min device width, 601 pixels, so it's at least a 600 pixel monitor. It's at least a 601 pixel monitor. All right. Why do you have the? Why do you need the two things in there? You need the two things in there because sometimes devices lie and tell you that they're computers when they're not, and this sort of fixes it. Like the Windows Surface. Probably, <laughs> yeah, probably that one would, but. But that, that, screen, that, that screen doesn't always identify a computer screen. Sometimes mobile devices will lie. <laughs> All right? So you need both of those taken together. So now, let me save that. Now all we have to do is fix the desktop CSS. How will I change, and this is a question, what will I change in the desktop CSS to make it so that they're side by side and that the links go vertically? You would do LI display block. Okay. With the nav at 30% width. Okay. And the section at 60% width. Okay. That sounds good by me. So I'll say with 30%, with 60%, and dis display of black. All right. I think you're on to something. Let's, let's test it. This one doesn't change, right? It shouldn't because this style sheet doesn't apply in this case. The desktop, though, lo and behold, it does change. So it is now oriented in a two-column approach. The way this is set up, the stuff in this CSS file is going to overrule the stuff in this file. So that file gets applied first. If I don't change anything, if I don't overrule something, for example, 
let's say I don't put um, let's say I don't put a width for the nav. If I didn't put a width for a nav, the width is 100%. Why? Well, because I got that from the other style sheet. Again, this is sort of the cascading part. And this is why, if you think about it, this is a pretty clever way to do things. All right? You have a set of rules that apply, and then give it a certain condition, you can overrule all or none of those. So let's go and fix this. Let me take off the border. I can, or let, let's put it this way. I think actually I didn't listen completely to you. You just said put the width at 60% and the width of the other one at 30%. So I can actually take off those other ones and lo and behold, they still float left, they still have their borders. Why? Because if I don't say anything, this applies. This only overrules where there's overlap. All right. I could certainly put other rules in here as well. I could put body background yellow. That one's got a yellow background. The mobile one will still continue with the white background. If I put in here body, font family, Ariel, Helvetica, What's going to get this one? The mobile, the desktop, or both? Both. Because I put it in this one, all right, which means that that applies to everyone, and then I overruled some of them in the second one, but I didn't say anything about the fonts, so it won't overrule the fonts. So sure enough, we look at this. Well, that already had that font because that's the default font of the browser, but all right, notice that that changed the font. All right, let's try to make a tricky one. If I say background red, color white, these are just examples. These aren't meant to look nice. All right. But if I put, if I have in here, for the body, in style one, background red, color white, and I have on the desktop version, background yellow, what colors will each of them be? What colors will the mobile be? Well, background will be red, the font will be white. What colors will the desktop be? What color will the background be? be yellow. What color will the text be? It will be white. Why? Because I didn't overrule that. Remember, both these style sheets apply and this one takes precedence if this one has something in it that that one also has. If they don't have things in common, then both of them will apply. But where they do have things in common, the second one wins. So just to show you that this is the case, there's red with a, a background of white, and here will be yellow with a text of white, which you probably can't read at all. So we'll go, we'll change this to color 
black. And now, this one should stay the same, and this one should change to at least be readable. This is important. This takes you, how do I want to say, this takes you a long way in the right direction to be able to do this. I'm not saying this is the only thing you need to know, but this is very important that you have this down. Because we will continue to do this um, throughout the course. So <clears throat> even if, <clears throat> excuse me, even if we get to where we have two different sites, we're liable to still use some of these responsive techniques. All right. Um, questions at this point? If we possibly duplicate some of our styling, will you deduct points off of those from uh, the get-go? Uh, like, like, for example, if in both of them you had a style sheet and they did the same thing for mobile, is that? Um, no. I... I, I if we accidentally yeah, um, I'm trying to think what the downside of that would be. It's definitely not necessary Don't to do work that. And yeah, but well, I mean, until I right. The downside of that, yeah, the downside of that would be, let's say, our company colors change from red and white to green and white. You'd have to change it in two places. Right. All right, so. I, you'll probably get by with a warning on that one. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. You know, yeah. Assignment. Yeah. That. Yeah. I, I. I doubt if I deduct for that. You could do the test of submitting it and seeing if I notice that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I. I. I'll commit. I. I won't deduct for that. That is, uh, if anything. Well, I'd say if anything, it makes it absolutely clear by reading the one style sheet. But you're really not taking advantage. Yes. It's probably a better idea not to, but it's not horrible. Okay. It's better than using a break tag. And it's far better than using a font tag. Other questions? If we use an H1 tag in our HTML, are you going to do anything about that? Or do you really want the font size set in the CSS? If you use... No, it's okay to use an H1 tag. That doesn't violate that because... An H1 tag says, this is not plain text, this is a heading. This is a top level heading. All right? It is part of styling, too. Well, there, well, I would phrase it a little bit differently. I would say that there's a default style that the browser applies to that. And by default, it makes it bigger. All right? But that's simply the browser's default styling. Just like a link, if you define something as a link. If you don't say otherwise, the browser's going to make it blue, and it's going to make it underlined. But that doesn't mean that you can't use a link. What it means is that, as with anything, you can either take the default, or you can control it and make it the way that you want it to be. So it's not bad to use an H1. That's not really putting style in your HTML document. You, if you have a top-level heading, make it an H1, because that's what it really is. Just like if you have a link, make it a link, because that's what that is. But you could show a top-level heading a couple different ways. You could show it as a, a bigger font. You could show it as a different color font. You could show it as a different font family. Or you could do any combination of those things. So that kind of stuff you would control via the CSS. But the fact that it's a top-level heading, that's what that content means. That is like a chapter heading in a book. Chapter heading in a book is different than the text, so therefore it's appropriate to put a tag in there saying, hey, this is a heading, and this is just regular text. So no, the H1s and H1s and all that are fine. Those don't violate the rule of separating presentation and content because you're simply specifically describing that content as being a heading instead of plain old text. Other questions? All right, that's all I had for today. Uh, next time we'll probably review this because this is important. It's important that you get this down. So some of it should be review. Some of it is likely to be new. Uh, but it's important that you get this down because this is sort of the foundation of the rest of the stuff that we're going to do. We will probably look at a graceful degradation example, which essentially is the same thing except backwards. 
we start with a bigger style sheet or a more complicated style sheet, then we whittle it down.